good. Jude, Jude this morning, uh, the small but super relevant book for us today about standing for this right here, for this, believing it and following it. Jude began by saying, I desire to write about our common salvation, possibly God's sweet promises, the meaning of the cross, the Lord's glorious resurrection and the joys of heaven. Jude probably wanted to mention all that, but Jude said, as I put the pen to the paper, that all changed. I was compelled to exhort you to contend for the faith. And I had to do this because there were were some apostates, ungodly deniers of the truth who came in undetected and began to cause harm. You know, I like to call them creeps because they crept in. Because that's what they were. That's what they were. They were hindering people's walks with the Lord and making people think it was okay to live outside of the Lordship of Christ. And so far, Jude has been relating their offenses to real biblical examples to show just how off they are. He said, like the unbelief of the children of Israel, the rebellion of fallen angels and the sinful conduct of Sodom and Gomorrah, these people reject God and are living immoral lifestyles. He tells us they went the way of Cain. Cain was a murderer, but his pride and self-righteousness led him there. He thought he could approach God however he wanted to. Same with these. They had no regard for God or what he established in his word. Jude said, like Balaam, they were driven by greed and profit. They used manipulation to get ahead in life. And he concluded by saying that they rebelled like Korah, Kor was full of envy, and this led him to ignite a mutiny that ended up not only terminating his own life, but the lives of others. You'll remember it as this. He swallowed him up. The earth did. All these examples brought about disaster in different ways, just like these apostates who sneak into the church do. Well, today, Jude continues to warn against them, but he also will conclude his discussion about them by telling us their ultimate demise, which is not good. Not good at all. But he does it so we will take our Christian lives seriously and guard ourselves from being tempted to be pulled away from the faith. See, through it all, Jude is encouraging us to trust fully in the Lord and his word, which is exactly what we need to do. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We ask that you do great and awesome things in this place. We need you, Lord. Lord, especially as we walk in this world that mostly does not know you, Lord. They do not walk according to your ways, and we see just unrighteousness flourishing. Lord, help us to be people of your word, people who who take what you say here, believe it with our whole hearts, and do it. Lord, we love you. We ask that you be with this time. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Okay, Jude speaking of the apostate creeps, he says this, starting in verse 12. He says, these are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I feel like saying, Jude, why don't you just tell us what you think about all this? (laughs) But even though what Jude says is brutal, I must admit, I am very impressed with the stunning description that he brings. I mean, he brilliantly depicts how destructive and dangerous these individuals are in the most poetic way. And he begins by saying, these are spots in your love feasts while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. When the early Christians met together, in addition to going through the word, they would also spend times in fellowship where they would eat together regularly, which is not too different than what we CCLX people do at our food gatherings. And I'm still thinking about our men's breakfast and and those biscuits and gravy, which were home run. That, plus whatever that other scrumptious thing was by that anointed chef, that was so good. And next month, shameless plug, I heard it will be chicken and waffles. So guys, don't miss out on that. But ladies, don't get jealous. We should be planning our all-church barbecue at a, a real soon. And those are always so satisfying. And I'm just picturing pulled pork and brisket. I'd love to eat. I'd love to eat. But eating together is biblical. It is biblical. And that's why I can say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. You know, the early church, they did the same sort of thing. And for some, especially the poor in the church, it would be one of the only times they would really get to eat well. But these godless individuals, they could care less. They only cared for themselves. It's not too hard to picture them selfishly going straight to the front of the line, bumping people aside, taking all they want with no concern for the needs of others, especially the least of them who could literally be starving. 
Even the phrase Jude uses, these are spots in your love feasts. It paints a picture of their selfish and sloppy behavior. I mean, it's like they, they grab all their food and like the brute beast that they are, they make a mess of everything. I mean, I just picture them dropping barbecue sauce or whatever all over themselves. But Jude, he doesn't say they, they got spots on themselves during the feast, but they themselves are the spots. They are the blemishes. They are the ones that cause the problems. They are the very thing that is messing up the pure and holy work God is aiming to do in people's lives. He goes on and says, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds. Clouds without water speak of drought, something we Californians know all about. You know, we are one of the top 10 states that always seem to find ourselves in a drought. So even though most of us don't like it when it rains, we need it to rain. <laughs> it's a good thing. And the clouds are, are what carries in the rain. And I personally think clouds are absolutely stunning to look at in the sky, especially if, if the sun rays are piercing through. You know, to me, it's like God's canvas in the sky. But if they always float in without ever producing water for rain, then there is no sustaining of life. All that will come is dryness and drought. Jude's saying that's them. They will look the part. They may even uh, amaze people with their skills and ability, but inside of them, there is dryness. Inside of them, there is a drought taking place. No spiritual life. He adds to that by saying, they are late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. I mean, that connects perfectly to what Jesus said in John chapter 15, where he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. The only way for spiritual fruit to be produced is to abide and stay close to Jesus, which these people, Jude is saying, they're not doing. They're not doing. Jude says they are twice dead. There's no fruit because they are not plugged into the vine and, there are no, and their roots are pulled out from true godly nourishment. They are spiritually dead. There's no personal relationship with Christ. And because of that, they have nothing of the spirit blossoming from their lives. They are, verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. We've all seen the sea rage, right? It's much better to be looking at the sea rage from on the shore than it is to be in the water. You don't want to be in the water. But Jude is saying the chaos these guys are stirring up is so erratic and so destructive, it's just like the raging sea. You know, when there's a storm in the ocean, the waves don't go, hold on, I see a boat, let's settle down a little bit. There might be people on there, I don't want to destroy them. I mean, it would be awesome if waves did that, but that's not what they do. They, they will go full force into whatever is in their way. And that's what he's saying, these guys are the same thing. Like the vicious power of the waves of the sea, there's no care or consideration for the lives they are affecting. They will strike with full force and do damage without any remorse. How about one more Jude? <laughs> he calls them wandering stars. You know, stars do not wander. They are fixed in the sky. And we know this to be true because before modern technological advances, the stars were the greatest tool for navigation, especially for those in the sea. People learned to read the constellations so they could know exactly where they were, they were based on what they saw in the sky. I mean, imagine them trying to follow stars that continued to wander. They would be on no set path. If, they fo if they, someone followed wandering stars, they'd be all over the place and could potentially be lost forever. The same is true if the people believe the lies and false doctrine these people were bringing. You know, I do think it's worth noting there are, there are wandering stars out there. We call them shooting stars. You know, stars in general, they always make me think of camping because you can actually see stars when you're camping. Unlike here where, where, where you could see maybe one or two because of our wonderful smog that we have in our sky. But because we never see stars, when we go out camping, we can gaze up and we can see an innumerable amount of stars. Have you ever done that? And you, you get out camping and you're like a, a mage. You're like, whoa, look at all these incredible stars. There's millions of stars out there. And you are amazed until you catch the sight of a shooting star moving through the sky. And then what happens? From that moment on, you forget all about the millions of stars that you see just a few seconds ago. And you are waiting in anticipation, so desiring to see another shooting star. Well, at least that's me and my kids. <laughs> it's like you don't even realize that all those stars are there any longer. You just want to see another fast-moving, wandering star through the sky. What, well, it's crazy. That's not even a star. A shooting star is really only a streak of light caused by tiny pieces of dust or rock falling into the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. That's all it is. I mean, think about that. We are mesmerized 
by dirt. <laughs> when, when the real thing is right there and we're mesmerized by dirt falling to the sky. I mean, how applicable is that for all this? People could come with something that sounds so fresh and so exciting, things that tickle our ears and entice our flesh for excitement. But what they're offering is not real. What they're offering is only a facade, it's just dirt. They are drawing our attention away from the real thing onto something that is wrong, destructive, and contrary to the real thing. We have the real thing. Jude says, watch out for those who are wandering stars and, and that will cause you to wander from the truth. But Jude does not only describe them, he tells us their end. The end of verse 13, he says, they are wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. A shooting star, it, it disappears forever. The same will be true of these people. They've gone astray, they're leading others astray, and because of that, they will face judgment for it. They are in for a very unpleasant surprise because of all they're doing. Nothing gets past God and he will hold them accountable for their actions. This is like, whew. I mean, this is serious. This is a big deal. And, and to further illustrate his point, Jude turns to another incredible biblical example, as he always seems to do. <laughs> Look at verse 14. He says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them for all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So far, you're like, wow, maybe I should have stayed home and prepped for the Super Bowl instead of coming today, because there's a lot of judgment going on. And judgment, really, judgment is a hard thing. It's a hard thing to talk about. But it's important to understand, because the Bible teaches that all who stand opposed to God and his plan for redemption will face judgment. They will face judgment, which is something Enoch in his day knew all about. Some of you are like, who? <laughs> who? You know, Enoch is not someone we talk a lot about, but he is one fascinating, fascinating person to study. You know, besides being listed in genealogies, Enoch is only mentioned in Genesis 5, Hebrews 11, and here in Jude. And Jude first wants to make sure we know exactly who he is talking about. So he begins by saying in verse 14, Enoch the seventh from Adam, which is very important because there is another Enoch in scripture. The other Enoch was the son of Cain. Yep, the firstborn son of Adam and Eve, the Cain who murdered his brother and Jude used to describe the apostates he is writing about. So Jude, he clearly wants us to know it's not that one. <laughs> he's, he's like, it's, I'm not talking about the third from Adam on Cain's side. I'm talking about the one from the line of Seth. The Enoch, who is the seventh from Adam, the godly man who Jude, inspired by the Holy Spirit, declares God used to prophesy this judgment. And even though there are not many verses directly about Enoch, there is so much. There's so much we could glean from him. And in Genesis 5, that's where we find him. And this is what we were told. I'm going to read it to you. It says this, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. People lived a little bit different back then. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. That's what we have about Enoch. You're like, okay, so what? Huge deal life-changing, mind-blowing information we have for right here. Let me tell you why. In the passage, first thing we learn, and during the first part of his life, we are told nothing about his spiritual status. There's no information about it, nothing at all, just facts. It says this, it says, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. But all that changes after he has a son. After he has a son at the youthful age of 65 years young, by the way. After that, we are, are then given great insight into his life. And it says, after his son Methuselah was born, Enoch, Enoch walked with God 300 years. You hear that, right? Not only the length, but the depth of that statement. Something happened that redefined Enoch's whole life. And from that moment on, we are told Enoch started to walk with God. 
And walking with God means probably what you think it means. That Enoch had an intimate and continuous fellowship with God. But it was not only for a little bit of time, that close relationship lasted for the next three centuries as he was on the earth. And what is so awesome about this is that out of all the listings of all the descendants of Adam, no one else is given a description like this. Showing us Enoch's relationship with God was so special. It was so real, it was so close, it was so intimate. He believed and trusted God with his entire life. You know, the only other close descendant around this time who was said to walk with God besides Enoch was, does anyone know? Noah, Noah. And Noah is not as mysterious of a person as Enoch. We're all familiar with Noah, right? I mean, seriously, there has been, has to be hundreds of different kids' books about Noah. I've seen a ton. I mean, the cover always has some rendition of an old man, right? With a big boat and animals sticking their head out open windows. I mean, everyone knows about Noah and the ark. Well, at least the boat and the animal part, right? But as Bible-believing Christians, we know that there's much more to the story than seeing a diversity of animals uh, taking a nice sea cruise in the rain, right? There's much more to that. We know the whole reason the ark was built was because wickedness was flourishing all throughout the earth. And God became so grieved. He became so grieved because people strayed so far from what he designed for them. And because of that, the Lord called Noah to build the boat, grab his family, all the animals, because he was going to judge sin and start over through him. And you're like, Justin, that's great. Thanks for the recap, but what does that have to do with Enoch? Everything, everything. By Genesis highlighting and emphasizing that Enoch had a strong walk with God, we can safely conclude that many at this time did not fully commit themselves to him. As sin entered the world through Adam, violence and corruption quickly began to spread, continuing to get worse and worse until one day God had to step in and put an end to it all. Enoch is such an important person because he was right there in the midst of all the spread. All the iniquity spreading through the earth. He was there. And though the earth was full of sin and wickedness was abounding during his lifetime, the Bible praises Enoch for not giving into the ways of the world, but living a life that is set apart to God. In fact, in Hebrews 11, we are told that Enoch pleased God because with all that was going on, Enoch stayed focused on his spiritual walk. He placed all his hope and trust completely in God when many didn't. And that's why he was included in the infamous hall of faith, along with others, other giants of the faith, people like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Joseph and Moses and David. He was included with them. Enoch, who many of you are like, that's the first time I heard the name. He was included with them. Again, not not a lot of verses on Enoch, but he was a man of faith we can learn so much about. But there was something else incredible, incredible, uh, incredible about Enoch. Because he walked by faith in the midst of a spiraling out of control world, something spectacular happened to him. Genesis 5, 24, it says this, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Hebrews 11, it records it this way. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. As the world was spiraling out of control and continuing to fill itself with corruption and immorality, God decided he needed to bring judgment upon the ungodly. But before he did, he snatched up Enoch from the earth. What happened with Enoch is a picture of the rapture of the church. A a, a depiction of what will happen for us. Think about that. As As our world is spiraling out of control, continually heading down a very disheartening path of immorality and corruption, I'm not the only one who sees this, am I? No. Before judgment comes upon this Christ rejecting world during the most troubling period this world will ever see, known as the tribulation period, before that judgment comes, Our Lord made a promise to all those who walk with him in John 14 that he will receive him to himself. Sounds just like Enoch. You know, we mentioned Noah. Noah and his family are a picture of the Jewish people who will go through the tribulation period and will be preserved through the time of testing. But Enoch represents what will happen to the church. Before the reign of judgment, God took him. Before the worldwide judgment on this world, we will be taken up. Just like we are promised in John 14 and 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, which I'm gonna read to you, it says this. 
Uh, starting in verse 16 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together and with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. He adds this, therefore, comfort one another with these words. I like that he adds comfort to that. Because knowing Jesus will rescue us from the end judgment coming upon this world is really comforting to know, right? I mean, for those of, us who, of, of, those of you who are journeying with, with us through Revelation on Thursday nights and seeing all that's going on, all that's gonna come upon this earth at this time, I believe comfort is a great word to describe what it means not to have to endure all that this world will have to face. I will just have an inside reference for those who come on Thursday nights. Chapter nine. We don't wanna be here. Chapter nine. But Jesus said, uh, along with comforting, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled because he will come and get us. I, I would be troubled to go through the judgment. But I am relieved, I'm comforted to know that before it is poured out, Jesus will take me to be with him forever. And knowing what we know, I believe it makes studying the end really joyful. It makes studying the end comforting because you know you're not here and then it makes you go, wow, I really want to know the end of the story. The end of the story is Jesus wins. But there's some troubling times that, that come and it's so good, it's so refreshing to know that we will be taken before that judgment comes. That's what we see with Enoch. But what I'm also discovering more and more as we are going through Revelation and, and talking about the end is how we as Christians are called to live as the day is approaching. How we are called to, to live these pure and holy lives how we are to, how we should be, what we should be doing with our time as we wait. What, what Enoch was doing. And yes, I believe Enoch is a picture of the rapture and the hope of our deliverance. But that's not it. His life, before he was taken up, is also an example for us as well. That like him, we are to keep walking by faith, staying as close as we can to the Lord no matter what. You know, what Enoch was experiencing was the same things we are facing today. All the sin that is, we see running rampant out there, all the hate, all the sexual immorality, all the injustice, you name it. All the rejection of the ways of God, that was happening during Enoch's time. But learning from Enoch's example, we can see that it's possible, even with all that, it is possible to live the God-pleasing, set-apart life in a declining world. And that by walking with the Lord, placing our hope in him, clinging to his promises is always the right thing to do, even when things we see are difficult to see. <laughs> even when we have to face difficulties in our life, even when we experience it, it is always better to walk with God. You know, though not written, we can easily imagine what Enoch went through. I mean, being described as the, as the only one besides Noah as walking with God, do you think Enoch was ever mocked or persecuted for his faith? Absolutely. Do you think people thought he was crazy? He was crazy for, 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 for proclaiming that a judgment was gonna come upon this world. You think he, they thought he was crazy for not partaking in all the pleasures of this world? Oh yeah, following God instead. Do you think, let me ask you this question. Do you think he was ever tempted to throw up his hands as he looks around and say, I can't take anymore and enter a place of depression and get overwhelmed with all that's taking place? Do you think he ever felt that? I do. But we're also told that Enoch, he pressed on. He pressed on. To, to him, living a life walking with God was his priority. It was the greatest privilege in his life and he remained committed to the Lord for 300 years. He stayed focused on the Lord. Can we learn anything from that? In the same world that we're experiencing today, he stayed focused on the Lord and he walked with the Lord for 300 years and then the Lord took him. He delivered him. I find it so amazing. I'm, I'm amazed studying Enoch. That's why we're gonna be here till like 12. I find it so amazing that right after we are told that Enoch was pleasing to God and taken up, the writer of Hebrews, he writes this right after that. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know why I'm amazed by this? Because the Holy Spirit didn't tell the writer of Hebrews to write that sentence after Noah, the next person in the line in chapter 11 there. He did not tell him to write that after Abraham or after Moses. He told him to write that after the one Old Testament individual who represents what God will do with the church. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I, I believe it's perfectly inserted there because God wants to, us to know something. And what he wants us to know is if we walk with him, if we place our faith in him and seek him with our whole hearts, he will reward us. 
And, and he will reward us first with him, his presence on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis, like he did with Enoch. But also we will, we will have the reward of eternity, the assurance of eternity with him. You know, studying Enoch, I'm seriously, I am seriously, my mind is, and it's not about him. It's about God. It's about God. Uh, I'm amazed at how God responds to us if we simply walk with him and trust him. It's so much better than anything out there, than anything any creep or denier of God's truth would try and lead us astray with. Following the Lord is so much better. May we do it with our whole hearts like Enoch. And that's the question. Are you? Are you? It's serious. Are you walking with him? Are you placing your hope in him every single day? Or not? Are you ready to give up? Don't. Are you ready to throw up your hands and walk away because all that's taking place in this world or your personal life? Don't. Maybe, do you think you have gone too far from him, you've done too much wrong? If you have breath, there's time to walk with him. You know, it, it didn't say Enoch started walking with the Lord until he was 65 years old. But once he started, he never stopped. And he ran his race until God took him to his real home. Church, may that be the same for us. Is it possible to live the set-apart life in the midst of an, uh, a spiritually declining world? Yes, there's proof. Enoch is the proof. That's for us in Christ. But for, for those not found in him, Jude does, uh, does state what Enoch, the seventh from Adam, said all those years ago. He says the, the ungodly will be judged. And he says that five times in that, in that uh, passage there. Ungodly means unholy, sinful, immoral, unrighteous, and evil but could also be defined as not showing any reverence to God. And Judah's saying specifically, though, that's what those apostates are. And then he runs through how their ungodliness is being manifested. He says in verse 16, he says, these are grumblers, which means they don't hold back their discontent or displeasure. They moan, they mutter, they murmur about everything. I like that word grumble because it actually, it actually sounds like what it is, right? <laughs> that's what they do. They grumble. And then they complain. It says complainers walking around uh, to their own, uh, walking according to their own lusts, which means they're fault finders. They have problems with everyone except themselves. They never seek to lift up, but have no problem tearing down. They are ones that criticize, are quick to speak a harsh, unedifying word. They even gossip and slander. I read this and I'm like, uh oh. This is what he says of, of the ungodly. This is what he says of, of, of the wicked. And I have to say, hopefully we are not doing these things because Jude is describing the ungodly, the apostates, not true believers. If this is how apostates are characterized, then what describes us should be much different. And he goes on to say, and they, they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. They are articulate. They are eloquent individuals. They know how to get ahead. Did you notice all of Jude's descriptions of them revolve around what comes out of their mouth? And on one end, they complain about everything, but on the other, they flatter to try and persuade and manipulate. You know, I read a quote that said, said flattery will get you nowhere unless you want something. <laughs> flattery, it, it feels good, right? It feels good when someone uh, um, does that with us. When they speak, speak good of us. It, it, it makes our flesh uh, bubble up. It's, it makes us feel special. But it's not done for your gain. It's done for their gain. They butter you up. I like that term because I love butter. I mean, this morning, I had two pieces of toast and I lathered butter all over that toast. And you know what I did when I, when I, I, I ate, I devoured that toast. But that's what they do. In the same way, these apostates will butter you up, but then they will chew you to shreds. You know, I read another fitting quote that said this, flattery looks like friendship, just like a wolf looks like a dog. And these are wolves who destroy lives. But in verse 17, there's a contrast. He says, but you, beloved, unlike them, he says, you, beloved, remember. Remember means recall. Don't ever forget. Keep right in the forefront of your mind. Remember what? The words which were spoken before by the, by who? The, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who are that? Who are they? Matthew, John, Paul, Peter. And where are they found? Right here. The words are found right here. We are to be people of the word. 
People who are filled with it, consumed with it. Yes, I did say last week or the week before, obsessed with it. On Thursday night, you know, we were looking at, at, at John and, and how he was called to eat, eat up the scroll and how we're to like nourish on the word, how we're to eat, feed on the word. And it got me thinking. I'm like, you know how I look at in and out Man, I look at in and out and I am drooling when I grab that burger. Or when I grab those Randy Do- Randy's donuts, I'm like, oh man, and my mouth is watering. And when I bite into those things, I'm like, oh, hallelujah. This is so good. This is this, 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 this satisfying. It's so yummy. It, it's it's the, the greatest thing to go into me. Well, except for God's word. Greater than any of that is God's word nourishing our souls. That's what it should be doing. And look, notice he says, remember in order to remember, you first have to have it in you. You can't remember something you've never learned. How do we get it in us? We go to this. You want to know how to walk uprightly? You want to know how to walk in sweet fellowship with God like Enoch did as, as the world is getting so wacky it's about to be judged? This is how. His word. This is how we know what is right and wrong. This is how we can stay focused and motivated when times are rough. This is how we are, will not be overwhelmed or discouraged and not compromise our walk. This is how we are able to contend for the faith by being people of his word. The answer is to fall in love with God's word. It's to hunger for it, desire it, to believe it, and to know that it will transform your life if you consume yourself with it. Remember God's word. And specifically here, Jude says, this will help you spot those who come in to pull away those wolves in sheep's clothing. He says in verse 17 again, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken uh, before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. They told us that? When did they tell us? Really where? Eat it up. Eat it up. And you will find out where it says that. I will give you a couple answers. Go to Acts 20, 29. Go to 2 Peter 3, 3. Go to 1 Timothy 4, 1. Go to 2 Timothy 3, 1, and on, and you'll see exactly what he's talking about. He says in verse 19, these are sensual persons. They're, they're all about feeling. They're not about the word. They're all about feeling. What is pleasing to the flesh, not only sexually, though that is something that we, was made clear earlier. Sensual is anything of the world. Whatever fits into John's description of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in 1 John 2, 16. It's, it goes on, it says, who caused divisions not having the Spirit? They stir up problems among the body. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. I heard it this way. It says this, you know how you can, do you know how you can spot a wolf in sheep's clothing? By what they are eating. If they are devouring other sheep, if they are discouraging them, if they are tearing them down, you know what they really are. They're not sheep, they're wolves, just as sheep in sheep's clothing. And they do it all because they do not have the spirits. They are not believers and they have crept into the church and tried to stir up problems and divide. And Jude says, contend for the faith because in the last days, these people will come in, they will distract, they will deceive, they will pull believers away from God's word. He's telling us, hold on to this. Stand on this, fight for this, be nourished by this. Paul called it in Philippians, the word of life. The word of life. That's what, what's found here. All that pertains to life and godliness, we are told. Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, make you free. What we need to do is we need to stick with the stars. And here's the stars are found right here. Not the dirt. Not those things that are fake. Not blazing dirt that's caught on fire. We're to stick with God's word. We're to be like Enoch who walked with God without compromise in a difficult culture and because of that, before judgment, he, God, will take us up. I mean, how good is that to know? Is that that refreshing and reviving? Aren't you thrilled that we have the same promise of Enoch, that we get to be taken up? Okay, can I mention one other thing that Enoch did and Jude pointed out? He prophesied. He spoke about the Lord coming back. The Lord is coming back. You know, the Bible tells us that one day Jesus will return to the earth and make things right. We're covering this a lot in Revelation. He will restore creation to the way it once was and set up his kingdom where he will rule and reign in righteousness. How wonderful will that be? I mean, even personally, no tears anymore, no pain, no struggles, fullness of joy forever in heaven. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. Do you guys ever think about that? Do you ever consider that? But in order to go there and experience that, you need to belong to Jesus. You have to belong to him. He must be Lord and Savior of your life. 
Jude tells us in the very early days, way back um, at the beginning of mankind, the seventh from Adam, a godly man named Enoch prophesied, he warned of the judgment that will fall on all who do not believe. And this is why I'm another, one more for today. And that is the message has not changed from when Enoch prophesied it to us today. This has been the truth from the beginning, just as true back then as it is today, that the ungodly will face judgment. And I know some of us are kind of like, judge them, Lord. <laughs> we look at some things that people do, and I'm like, oh man, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. And when they do, I'm going to laugh. I don't think we'll laugh. I don't think we'll laugh, because I don't think we'd want that for anyone. What the Bible says will actually happen. Where there will be literally weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who do not or not found in Christ. And that's not just the worst of the worst. That's all who do not, do not belong to God and, and, and will face his judgment. You know, this week I was, I was thinking about the, the finality of hell. And as I, I was laying in my bed, I seriously felt a chill go through my body. Because if, you, if people do not come to Jesus, if they do not accept him, hell is real for them. It's really gonna happen for them. There is not this, this universalism that, that God is love, so that means he's not gonna send anybody to hell. No, they've chosen that path. And, and God is going to honor that. But he has made every way possible for them. You know, he, hell is real, and for the unbeliever, the Bible says they will be judged according to their works. The things they do and the things they say. And if they're judged by their works, then no one is able to escape hell because no one can live a perfect, a perfect life. There's only one who could, and there's only one who did. And what he did was to save. That he came, the reason he came was to save. The, and he lived the life we could never live, but he also died the death we deserved because he, God loves us so much. And the only way to be rescued from judgment is by believing in what he did for us, giving himself for us. And I just have to plead with you, I have to share this. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, I beg you, I beg you that you would have your ears open, your heart open because it's the most important decision in your life. It is, it is real, it is serious and, and your works, no matter what you think, it cannot save you. They cannot save you. Your good deeds cannot save you. I know a lot of good per people. I have good people in my life who are much nicer and kinder than I am but they don't know Jesus and they're not found in him and because of that, they don't turn their lives around what that means is eternal judgment for them. Our works cannot save us. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We need to accept the salvation, the free gift of eternal life in him. And we're told in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not that we have to work to please God. We just have to believe in God. The works of God is that we believe in the Son. We believe in everything that he has done for us. And if you don't know him, I pray today that your heart would be open and you respond to the gospel, that God the Son, he came into this world. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son because he loves this world, because he loves you. And he stepped out of eternity to live the life you could never live and die your death so that you could have everlasting life in him. And if you've never made that choice, make that choice today. Don't let another day pass because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Tomorrow is not promised for anyone. And we need to make that decision for him. And if you haven't done that, I pray today you will. But I was also, I, it really hit me for those of us who, who do know God, who do know him and are people of his word. And, and I believe, you know, seeing all that is hard. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to grasp eternity for the unbeliever. But it is what, what will happen. There is judgment that is coming upon the ungodly, but we have to know God, a God of love would never do that. A God of love stepped down into heaven, uh, from heaven to come to the earth so that you would not go to hell. And that's all you have to do to receive and believe him. But, but as I was thinking about this, I was like, you know what? The more you read, talking about being people of God's word, the more you read God's word, the more you have his heart. You more, the more you see his heart for people, his heart for these people here, brothers and sisters in Christ, but his heart for the lost. Ezekiel 33, 11, it says of God, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. He says, turn, turn from your evil ways. 
God desires people to say, we see passages like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And again, I'm a shameless plug for Revelation. If you haven't joined us, join us. We're only ha- not even halfway through yet. There's still time. Watch the YouTube videos and then join us on Thursday nights. But what we are seeing in Revelation, that even in the tribulation period, the time of God's wrath, God is, is doing all he can to draw men to himself. I mean, God could just end it all within, in an instant. But what he's doing is he's slowly turning up the heat so people have every chance to be saved. And uh, one more thing that I was blown away about Enoch uh, as I was studying him. You know, Enoch, he had a son named Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. And he was the oldest person to ever live. He's the oldest person in the Bible. And I, I've always struggled. I've always struggled with going, why him? Like, I, I just don't get it, Lord. Why him? Why not Adam? Why not Noah? They were close but why not them? And then as I was studied Enoch, I learned that the year Methuselah died was the same year the flood came. And the, his name, the name Methuselah means man of, of javelin, man of javelin or a man of sending forth, javelin, judgment, man of sending forth. The Lord possibly revealed to Enoch the judgment of the flood and at, at that, at, when he was 65 years old. And then from that moment on, when he revealed that, he named his son, Methuselah, and he followed the Lord with everything he had in him. And then um, it it wasn't until Methuselah died did the flood come. So God held back the flood until Methuselah, it was time for him to die, which makes me go, wow, that's why he's the oldest. That's why he is the oldest in scripture. God kept him alive because he was desiring people to come to know him. And so he extended Methuselah's life. At least that's what I see (laughs) Methuselah was the oldest because God was giving people as much time as possible to repent. It's exactly the heart of 2 Peter 3, 9, where it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is the heart of God. And I have to say, church, if, if you are people of the word, it's going to be your heart too. That you're going to desire people to see People, to see people saved, to come, to turn from their wicked ways and to come to know the Lord. And you will become more patient. <laughs> you will become more long-suffering because you want, you desire to see people in your life saved. And that's my question for us as we end. Are we doing all we can to win them? Are we rising up to what he is calling us to do? Are we redeeming the time? I look around and I do wonder, I do wonder how long, how long until you come and snatch us up, Lord? How long? And then, but, but once that happens, soon after that, the judgment is going to be poured on upon this world. And we won't be here. You know, no one knows the day or the hour, but we can all know what we are supposed to be doing when he comes. And what we are to be doing is first get ready ourselves to live the, that pure life before the Lord. And the other thing we are to be doing is be busy for him. Are you busy for him? Are you serving? Are you using the gifts that he has given you to to minister to the body, to glorify his name and win the loss to him? I mean, it's challenging. It's challenging, but I look, I'm like, Lord, this is what you're calling us to do. This is exactly it. You desire people to save and you desire to use us. I don't understand why. I don't understand how, but you have called us to be this shining light to this world that needs you so bad. So Lord, may we shine. May you do all that, that you've, we do all that you've called us to do. Be the salt and light of this world because people who don't know you, my close family members who don't know you, they're gonna forever be away from you. And it's not just away. Weeping, gnashing of teeth, eternity. We ch- church Christians, we can't water that down. We can't, we can't explain it away. That's what the Bible teaches. And what we need to do is do everything we can to win people to him, to shine so brightly for him, to l- make sure that we are right with him. If you've never given your life to him, may today be the day, as Jason was saying, that this would be your glorious day, your day to give your life to him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the the joy it is to be in your word, to allow you to do great and awesome things in our hearts. So Lord, I just pray that you would build up your church, that you would truly use us at this time. Lord, I pray, Lord, if anyone does not know you, that they would open their heart to you even right now that we, we, they realize everything that we've been saying today, all that is true, or that your word, 
Lord, talks about those who do not know you being forever away from you. But Lord, for those of us who are in you, Lord, we have the promise of being with you forever. So Lord, do great things. Help us to walk uprightly. Help us to take Enoch as an example. Lord, the promise that we have of your coming, but also the, the seriousness, the soberly, that we're, how we're supposed to walk in this world. We thank you so much, Lord. We, we ask that you would just go before us now. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand? Let's glorify the Lord. Sing to him.